This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to yet another episode of Tao Unbound. I'm Ido Aroni, your host, and it is my pleasure to host here in our humble studio uh, a dear colleague of mine, Udi Aharoni, the director of the LAHAV program, which is part of the Kohler School of Management at Tel Aviv University. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Ido. And I, I must say that I'm, I'm sure that like all of us here at the university, you're very proud at the fact that Kohler was selected as one of the top business schools in the world recently, I think ranked number seven in terms of the number of entrepreneurs and CEOs of startup companies and technology companies and unicorns that came out of the university and outside of the United States, Tel Aviv University's Kohler School of Management is number one in the world, which I think is a great achievement. What do you think about that? Well, you know, this is what you see, the tip of the ice. In order to achieve it, you have to work for many, many years, you know, and uh, really promote our graduates and students uh, to achieve this. And it's a hard work, and we are really, really excited that it works. So before we jump into the details of your program and your great offerings, and we'll talk about what is it that we're offering international participants in the LAHAV program, which you run. You, you've been doing this for many years. Right. Uh, we usually start our podcast with some personal questions. Now, here, obviously, my first question to you, you know, my last name is Aharoni. Your last name is Aharoni. We we know already that we're not related. But tell me about the origins of your Aharoni. Well, uh, first of all, yeah, we tried like 30 minutes to find out whether we have uh, connections or family connections. Uh, but my anxious, my late father was already born in Israel. Um, he passed away, but he was born in Israel in 1930. But our family mainly came from Afghanistan, which is quite rare. Where in Afghanistan, this is a huge family debate. Everyone uh, claims that we come from a different city, but um, the originally is really somewhere between Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Nobody really knows where, but this is, uh, but I must say, that my mother um, is, was born in Germany, and so I know both cuisines, the European one and the Afghan one, which is the best in the world. And, and, uh, and you know that our Aharoni uh, family came from what is today Uzbekistan, not far from Afghanistan. And, and I think that in Central Asia, um, hundreds of years ago, there was a very prominent Jewish community, mostly of merchants along the Silk Road right. between China and Europe, and they were known for their rugs, for their leather goods, for their jewelry. And of course, until this very day, Afghani Jews are known and excel in the trading of, uh, of gems, of, good, of, of diamonds and, uh, and, and, uh, and jewelry and so on. And so um, I'm assuming it was a different kind of, uh, a different version of Aharoni, maybe Aharon Zadeh or Aharonian or something like that. No, it was with uh, what we called in Hebrew, Vav Bet. It was Aharonov, in a matter of fact. So just like our family. Yeah. Most of them, uh, most of these uh, immigrants were called Aharonov, Itzhakov, Moshonov. Moni Moshonov is the same. Uh, the famous cooker Israel Aharoni came from Bukhara. So most of them was um, by the initial uh, Nov in the end. Uh, part of our family is still Itzhakov, other part of the family, but everyone changed it when they uh, immigrated to Israel. Right, and my, fa my father did the same. My father's, our family came here in 1874. They settled in Jerusalem, the Aronofs, um, and my father changed his last name uh, after 1948 from Aronoff to Aharoni. Well, the same to my family. My father changed it also after the war. They came to Jerusalem. They live in what they called in Hebrew, Shkunat Bukharim, yeah. with many of the Jews that came there. This is why it's called uh, the people from Bukhara initiated this uh, neighborhood during the 90s, the end of the 90s. And uh, my family was settling in Jerusalem for many years, from 1930 even before, up till uh, the Independence War. And during the 50s, they moved from Jerusalem into Tel Aviv. So we come from the same, you know, historical tradition. And, um, and I'm, I'm assuming 
Were you born in Jerusalem or? No, I was born in Asuta in Tel Aviv. You were born right here in Tel Aviv. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing and, and what is it in your upbringing that brought you to what you're doing today? Wow. I think there is no connection <laughs> because, um, I mean, I was uh, living most of my life in, uh, in near Tel Aviv, in a neighborhood called Ramat Khan. And uh, I made different passes in my entire life, uh, from the business world into the academic world. And during, uh, I mean, after the year 2000, I decided to make a career change. Uh, in my personality, you know, in this, those days, we didn't call it entrepreneurship or startups. We call it different names, just initiatives. And uh, so I made uh, a lot of changes uh, from the business world into the academic world. And during the last 16 years, um, I'm teaching at the faculty since the beginning from year 2001 especially in strategy and mainly in innovation strategy. This is my passion. This is where it comes my passion to innovate, to change, uh, to challenge. Agility is something that I believe in for over 20 years. And uh, this is what I'm doing since 2006. So I'm very curious to hear about strategy in business. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a second. But before that, tell us about your business experience. So before you, you moved to the academic world, you actually worked in the business world. What was your experience like? Oh, mainly international business, mainly with traditional countries like in Europe and so forth, mainly import and export. Uh, so I was very familiar with international activities. And already since then, I know that, you know, as an Israeli small country far away from all major markets to just work locally, really, I mean, you cannot really evolve very much. So, and I think as Israelis, we have to contribute to the world and can learn a lot from the world and bring another way of thinking. And this was what I was doing through all my career. Now, there's a, you know, the conventional wisdom is that Israelis are very good when it comes to finding solutions to problems that others think that are insurmountable. Israelis are very good in improvisation. Israelis are very good finding tactical solutions to problems. But at the same time, Israelis are very bad when it comes to the ability to develop long-term strategy. Now, two questions for you. The first, is this your impression too? Second, and if so, what would you say is characteristic to the Israeli business community? when it comes to strategy? Well, first of all, I agree with it totally. Um, this is one of the reasons uh, in 2005, we initiated at our school, uh, the Eli Hurwitz uh, Institute of, for Strategic Management, um, the, the first one who really uh, was the chairman of this was, of course, Eli Hurwitz, who is known in Israel as Mr. Strategy. And the main purpose was really to change the mindset of short-term into long-term perspectives. I think Israelis are lack of long-term perspectives. There are many reasons for it. Some of them are correct. You know, we are living in an agile world. We live in an uncertain environment. But if you look globally, you see a lot, you know, many people ask me about big companies in Israel. I think there are not many companies in Israel besides, you know, some government entity or... Uh, other uh, big uh, weapon companies uh, that have revenues over $3 billion. Why? Because we think for the short term. This is one of our benefits. We know how to really solve problems. This is how part of how we develop uh, this tremendous ecosystem. On the other hand, how many companies you know like Checkpoint that made the whole way from a garage startup till billions of revenues? And with IPO and so forth, many, as you see, many, many startups are selling themselves by the end of the day because most of the mergers and acquisitions, these are just acquisitions by big companies to the big guys, you know, uh, for a valuation of 100 or 200 or 300 million dollars. And the question is whether we can do different. 
So I really believe that we should really develop in Israel much more strategic way, um, much more long-term in perspective, but it's still a challenge that, um, I've, I mean, I ran this institute for 14 years and this was our main purpose, but it's still a huge challenge to think, uh, to educate executives in Israel for long-term thinking rather than uh, short-term thinking. You know, one of the explanations as to this phenomenon that you just described is that we, the Israelis, are programmed always to give priority to the urgent over the important. And the reason is because we are programmed to deal with threats. And because of the geopolitical predicament, the state of Israel has been in a state of emergency since 1948. And I would argue that perhaps since 1945, since the Arab economic boycott, which was meant to suffocate the little economy that we had here in 1945. So, so given the fact that you will always find that the, in the eyes of the Israeli typical manager, the urgent always takes precedent over the important. How can we change that? What is it that we can show them and teach them to make them internalize uh, the need to develop long-term strategy? Well, this is an interesting question because as a one who believes in long-term strategy, I may ask you the opposite idea. Why? Because first of all, we are a small country. These are facts. We are far away from all major markets. This is a fact as well. So maybe the solution is less developing, and it's not my opinion, it's just, you know, broad thinking. Maybe the solution is thinking more about collaboration opportunities. We are small, so let's get in kind of a collaboration with the big names. And, you know, we have this expression in our programs that we refer in, in a moment that it called born global. It doesn't mean necessarily just the American way. It can be Chinese way, it could be European way, South American way. So let's make collaboration opportunities, make one plus one equal maybe three, rather make than make the whole way by ourselves, which is a very difficult task for a faraway country, far from all major markets, living in an uncertainty. These are, you know, these are the conditions since 1945. It doesn't seem that it's going to change dramatically Right. Uh, for the good, I'm not saying for the worse in the next year. So maybe this is a better solution. Collaboration opportunities, m and strategies. Uh, so there is no, of course, coherent one solution, but maybe this is the, a better and, way. And, and I totally agree with you. And I think that the fact that we live today in a world of hyper-connectivity, right? We've never been more connected technologically. It gives us an opportunity to do that. Um, but before we go into the actual description of the program of LAHAV, the program that you're heading, uh, you know, in my classes, I, I talk a little bit about Sweden. And because Sweden is a little bit, you know, bigger than Israel in terms of population. I think they're like a little bit over 11 million people. So in terms of size, it's almost the same size as Israel. But when you look at the uh, number of brands and businesses and industries that Sweden has developed. And Sweden has been a market leader, even in areas like sports and uh, music. You know, ABBA, we all remember ABBA. And of course, not to mention retail and heavy industry and, and more recently technology and so Pharmaceutical on. Pharmaceutical also. Pharmaceuticals, of course. And so the question is, when you compare... You know, it's just that when I talk to people about Israeli football, I always ask them, how come Croatia, with three and a half million people, has produced such a great team? And, you know, so the question is, what can we learn from the examples of other countries like Sweden that is more or less same size as Israel? What can we learn from their experience? Well, I once, many years ago, thought about it. I, I kind of wrote a paper, why we don't have an Okia in Israel. On that time, not now, when Nokia had like 35,000 employees around the world and worth billions of dollars. I think one reason is that Sweden is a great example because they have IKEA, which you say, furnitures, Sweden, how come? They have, you know, uh, they had, it's not right now a Swedish company, but they had Saab and Volvo. The, I think the answer is that they have nearby markets. So if they want to expand, 
they can go to Norway, they can go to Denmark, and they have kind of a much bigger um, near market than we have. We don't have nothing out of it. You, I mean, you cannot do anything uh, export to Egypt or to Jordan because their economy is rather poor. So they can produce a local brand and expand it step by step. We don't have this privilege. We have companies that what I call born global from phase one or from day one. Otherwise, they won't exist. And during that those which I asked Finland, you know, again, it's worse than Finland. Far away market, speaking funny language like Hebrew, uh, an island by the end of the day. So how, how they can have these big companies? I think it's the way that they can expand, which you cannot. That's, a, I think, a very valid argument that you're making, which leads me beautifully uh, into the description of, of Lahav. So tell us a bit about the history of how Lahav come about and what is the main purpose of it? So uh, Lahav was initiated by our first first dean, Professor Yair Aaroni, which also we tried to find the family connection, but he was not even from that area because he was from Bulgaria. So, uh, but he also Bulgarian. He must have been Aronov also. Could be. Yeah. Well, listen, we ruled the world. <laughs> yeah. I mean, clearly. <laughs> so he was a first dean, and um, the business school was established in 1965. And already in 1968, he really realized that there are, and that time it was just local managers who doesn't want uh, to have just an MBA or have an MBA that want to have practical academia. On one hand, the best knowledge that we have in our school and in our university, and on the other hand, practice and on experience. And this is what we are doing since 1968. We are celebrating this year 55 years of uh, managerial development by the end of the day. And... Uh, what we called in English executive education. And this was our main purpose, really to educate and give practical schools, tools uh, to local, uh, during the first years, of course, to local uh, managers in Israel in order uh, to evolve uh, the managerial skills of all managers in Israel. We are doing it uh, with government entities, uh, with private entities, we are doing it locally, and in recent years we are doing it uh, globally. And, uh, and uh, the global dimension of it has been growing very rapidly. And I know that from previous conversations that we had, that we've been very successful in places like Latin America, Asia, and so on. And the question is, if you can share with our listeners and our viewers some examples of what they can expect uh, to the kind of offering the program is making for international participants. So uh, our program runs on a full spectrum from MBA students, EMBA students, uh, to executives uh, one by one or in open enrollment programs or from uh, different companies. And Israel, and this brings us to the previous conversation, is Israel as a startup nation. Israel is a very interesting phenomenon. And, you know, if you look on the hard facts, less than 10 million citizens far away from somewhere in the Middle East, uh, war zone in a way, and so first, that's what people think, of course, Still, some people think we have camels on the streets, which is funny, but still today. And we come right now, I mean, by if you look on economics uh, values, our GDP per capita is around 54 or 55,000 US dollars, which is by nominal the 14th in the world. And we don't have any natural resources, beside, of course, the gas in recent years, but this is brand new. We don't have any uh, production capabilities, something we excel. So it's a very, very rare uh, phenomenon that what I call we take our all disadvantage as a small country and trying to make a competitive advantage out of it with great success because the results of around 55,000 US dollars uh, GPT per capita is not something new. It's growing every year, but 10 years ago, it was like 10% less or something like this. So, And we were closing the gap with Europe and with the United States. And in fact, $55,000 GDP per capita per annum is more than most European countries. Right. 
We are number 14 in the world, totally. So it attracts people to understand it. And my philosophy was that we are not going to teach them this. Because, you know, at the beginning, when we had the first Chinese delegation, they tell us, tell us the secret. Well, there is no secret. It's a, how you build this ecosystem. So I tell everyone from students to executives, what we are trying to do in these short-term programs, which are usually like a week, we, we share with you our way. You cannot cut and copy it or cut and paste it, but we can think about how to take the advantage we have here, the advantage you have at home, and make one plus one equals three. This is the main purpose, to expose them to our experience, to show them collaboration opportunities, and to be a bridge between um, mainly government entities, but mainly business people, to Israeli companies and business leaders. And why? You have a lot of ex global experience. By the end of the day, business are done between people. And if you don't know the culture, if you don't understand the country, the philosophy of the people in that country, so it's high burdens. You don't know how to overcome them. So when they come to a public university like Tel Aviv University, the leading university in Israel, they trust us that we will really expose them to reality, that we really will show them how it really happens. So it's narrow the gaps. It's lower the burdens that we have. So after a visit here, I always have kind of an expression at the end of each program, and I say to each participant, the end of the program is just the beginning of our relations. Now you know Israel much better. Now the Israelis know your company or people from your country much better. And then this is the way for the next step. And we are trying to help them to have the next step in Israel as a public entity, we get a lot of help from the Foreign Office uh, Ministry. We get a lot of help from the Innovation Authority because by the end of the day, you know, we are all the same public entity that should help Israeli companies. Right. We're all working towards the same goal. Um, you know, I know that the participants, especially the international participants, say that, you know, as we say in English, rave reviews, right? They say that the, this is a life-changing experience. And can you give us some examples from the menu of, of what is in the program? I'm, you, you mentioned they get some exposure to Israeli businesses. They have exposure to Israeli business leaders. I'm sure they travel a bit uh, around the country. Can you just describe a typical um, program? Well, usually these programs are more or less like a week. And we bring two aspects. We bring the managerial aspects. So we expose them to the development of the ecosystem, uh, how we developed uh, the high-tech ecosystem, uh, meeting with, uh, you know, one hand, uh, macroeconomic people. On the, on the other hand, they see a lot of startups, visit a lot of interesting places, like even the kibbutz, which is, you know, we call it the first Israeli startup. It's a very interesting phenomenon. On the other hand, we uh, take them to cultural days to understand, you know, even nowadays, uh, you know, we have a lot of conflicts and noise in Israel. So we take, we bring sometimes a rabbi that explain to them the ultra-orthodox way of thinking, of debating, how it's influenced everyone in Israel back in our mindset here. So they see that Israel is not what they hear in the news, always troubles and... Uh, all kinds of conflicts they have. They see that Israel is totally different, that life in Tel Aviv is, first of all, much safer and much more fun than most of the cities in the world. You meet with small startups, so you see the way, for instance, we had a visit from one of the leading banks in uh, Brazil. The top management came to Israel last week. Uh, yeah, so they were very interested about fintech, how to take these te technologies that can help them really make the bank the transformation it needs to the new customer needs. So, and they were astonished how we look on things on a global perspective rather than just local perspective. So all these connections later on create really funds of evil all around the world. That's, that's incredible. And, um, and other than you mentioned fintech, what other areas would you say are of... Um, a very high demand when it comes to the international participants. I'm assuming you mentioned fintech. 
I'm assuming cybersecurity would be another one. Yeah, so cyber uh, definitely is one. Uh, food tech is right now a very interesting topic because really Israeli companies can solve huge uh, food demand prob uh, problems around the world. Uh, we also focus about entrepreneurship. We have, uh, you know, we have three pillars for this kind of program. Entrepreneurship, of course, but also entrepreneurship, how to take companies to the next level, how to make the transformation based, again, on our agility experience and a lot of innovation, how to think differently. For instance, uh, you know, you know the government um, environment very well. So the, an institute like the Innovation Authority, for instance, is something that countries don't have. We have it, you know, in purpose because part of uh, the Israeli success is the government support in uh, R&D, uh, the Innovation Authority. You know, in Israel, we are the first in the world uh, with investment in R&D per capita, 4.4 to 5% every year. This is one of the things that really pushed Israel. We have the university research. So to, to understand uh, how we take, uh, how we build remote as a commercialization uh, or technology transfer tech company within universities to take the academic research and to make it practical and on experience, this is something that for us, it looks like, well, this is our life. Of course, this is how it is, but it's not for everyone in the world. So to understand this, we have, you know, professors from university that said, well, we never thought that it could be maybe, yeah, we know MIT and that's it. How it's happening again in Israel, how you are doing it differently. And this is really what they are trying and what we share with them. How we share our, we don't try to teach them anything. We try to share the, with them our experience. And I think that another angle, of course, is the very healthy relationship and interface that exists between the Israeli ecosystem and the security establishment, especially the army. Uh, you mentioned MIT. MIT is known for its relationship with an agency in the U.S. government called DARPA. The DARPA is part of the American security establishment that is producing a great deal of innovation. In fact, some people claim that the Internet was invented by DARPA, but uh, I read it somewhere. I, I don't know if, uh, if, it's, if it's true. I'm assuming it's true. Why not? DARPA is uh, responsible for amazing stuff that changes everybody's life. Uh, I, can, I can spend hours with you, really, Udi. But uh, before we conclude, I wanted to ask you about the future. What would you like to see happening in your program, LAHAV, that we're here to discuss, what would you like to see happening in the future? Uh, in which way you'd like to upgrade the program going forward? Well, it's a long vision, but I hope that in the future we will be the hub, a world hub for all those kinds of activities, not single ones from China or from the States or from Europe, to be a real hub as Tel Aviv University, as Scholar School of Management, as LAHAV, to a kind of an innovation hub uh, that will be really uh, the spotlight for all the world. This is my Thank long you. term Thank goal. You. Thank you so much for articulating this vision. And uh, for our viewers and listeners, I just would like them to know that Tel Aviv University is about over 30,000 students, about 10,000 employees. So it's a community of about 40 to 50,000 people. Um, it's the number one producer of entrepreneurs in the country. When you look at the number of CEOs of technology companies and unicorns, as I mentioned at the, at the outset, Caller School of Management produced outside of the United States more CEOs of unicorns than any other university in the world. And I think that's quite an achievement. And you're running LAHAV, which is a training program uh, for practical management for people from all over the world. So we have tens of thousands of listeners uh, to this podcast, and I hope that some of them, uh, their interest was sparked by this conversation and maybe... Uh, you'll see a spike in the number of registrations coming from overseas. 
Well, we really hope so. Uh, we are, most of our programs are tailor-made, so not by a need to individuals, companies, universities, you are more than welcome and we'll be really, really happy to host you here. And I want to thank you, Ido, for inviting me. And we hope to see all our listeners, not all of them, 10% of our listeners here in Israel. I'm, It's I'm a sure. beautiful country. Well, we you, are waiting you, for you. You've done a great job. Uh, sharing with us really the beauty and the magic of your program and to our listeners and viewers goodbye from Tel Aviv until our next episode bye bye this is Taiwan bound the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University please welcome your host Ido Aroni Tel Aviv University's graduate member of the Board of Governors lecturer writer and veteran diplomats you 